Jujutsu Kaisen Q&A. Chris Sharp asks, how did your thoughts on the show change as you were going through it? So I, you know, honestly, I will say that one thing that really clicked for me and made me love the show was realizing that there's going to be a hyper focus on the characters and their backstories and their different personal philosophies and motivations. That I think is one of the most intriguing things about the show for me. That is what sort of elevates it beyond just, you know, the battle system and fighting, which is cool, but always in shows I'm looking for things I can extract to think about and hopefully make me better as a person, things to focus on. Some examples of that that came to mind that really helped solidify that that faith in the show for me in that, that regard were conversations between Megumi and Yuji about their personal philosophies and their clashing of ideals. The introduction of Gojo and the, the infinite, Nanami being a very distinct character. And then the latter half of the season, I think, ramped that up even more with the focus on the individual students during the, the tournament arc. Toto was huge, the conversations between Toto and Yuji. It's those things that I live for. It's the things that take characters and use them as vehicles for ideas. And I think what is special about Jujutsu Kaisen, one of the things I like about it, and I will say I expect to be even better going forward now that some of that groundwork has been established, is that interplay between the characters. You know, I think that a lot of them, especially the students, they have a starting point. They're given sort of a, a focus, and that focus is incomplete. And I, I'll talk about this later probably, but I actually have a feeling why that's why there seems to be sort of a lukewarm reaction to Yuji. It's because he's not quite formed yet. The events of the show launch his journey, and for the first time, it's like an awakening. He is kind of drifting aimlessly, it seems. He doesn't really have that many connections, doesn't seem like he has that many friends. He's got one family member that he's close to, and that's sort of his one obligation, his one duty. But then when the, with the events of the first episode, he experiences the death of his grandfather. He has increased power, which means increased responsibility, a la Spider-Man. And so he can no longer just be aimless, but he's just a kid and he doesn't really have any exposure to this world. And so he fixates heavily on the thing that has most affected him, which is giving people an honor, honorable death, which I'm still kind of chewing on, but I think it's meant to be incomplete. And that idea is suggested to me by a couple things. One is that the characters are not quite in agreement about what the goal is or what the meaning of life is, but they're all on the same path anyway. And you can see that they're starting to influence each other and sort of hash out these ideas in real time through experience, which to me is a, is a great model. You know, all, pretty much all the ideas I had, all the things I was certain about when I was young, turned out to have some truth in them, but were largely wrong or were incomplete, or there was just so much more nuance to explore in them. Any good worldview, any good belief has to be rooted in reality to some degree, but reality is just, is too large. There's no way to understand it. You can get glimpses of it through experience, through what the world is. And you know, you certainly can't hold a belief that's wrong and try to act it out and have the world tell you that it's wrong, have it keep not working or find holes in it and continue to believe it unless you're just really attached to it and you're afraid of what the, you know, the truth is or you're afraid of not having this sort of structure. And one of the best teachers in that regard is other people and our relationships with other people because that is gonna be probably most of our significant experience. It's gonna involve others. So it's this really interesting clashing of different personalities and different ideologies that I have faith will lead to something really interesting. I'm very interested to see where that goes. I feel like it's a little early. I, I really feel like season one was packing a, a lot in there to create the world, create sort of the question, you know, what are we doing this for? What is the meaning of life? Establish a lot of characters, establish the darkness so that in future seasons, that dynamism has time to breathe. And what I've seen in comments seems to support that. People are saying, if you think season one is great, you have no idea what, what later seasons are going to have in store. So that's very exciting. I think another key element in that regard is the scene between Gojo and Megumi, where Gojo basically spells out the fact that Megumi's philosophy and outlook is incomplete, that he can't fully imagine the whole. And in that whole conversation are metaphors about team playing. And I think he does say that jujutsu sorcery is an individual sport, and maybe that's right in regards to the profession, but I really think that the larger game being played, which is just the kids living their lives and discovering and trying to do good, is going to be a team sport and is going to require all of them. So to come back to the question, <laughs> that is really intriguing. That is sort of what surprised me about the show and made me start to have a lot of faith in it and its direction. Short answer, there is a depth that I didn't expect at first. What characters or character dynamics do you want to see more of next season? As far as characters, I think we need more Nobara. She had a great last episode, last couple episodes, but in the trio of her Yuji Megumi, she sort of wasn't really all there. And I think she has some of the coolest powers. I'd love to see more of her. Obviously, I want to see more Gojo. Gojo is such an interesting character just because he's so amazing and he's so perfect. It's almost a weakness. Obviously, I want more bromance between Yuji and Toto because episode, what was it, 19 and 20 were my favorite by far. I think that was some of the best writing in the show. Toto does this great job of being both deep and hilarious. I'm all over the place here, but back to the trio. The end of the season, I think, showcased them really well on what started as a normal mission, but, you know, developed into a lot more. I think it would be Okay, I think the show's earned it. It's earned a chance to show sort of the day-to-day, the, -day, the missions they go on, etc. Because most of the season was just like high stakes after high stakes after high stakes. But I think if shows do a, a good job with the characters, you enjoy the stuff in between just as much. I mean, as I've said before, I think some of my favorite 
My Hero Academia content is not the huge fighting arcs. It's both that and the stuff in between. And I think there's something really special about having both and having that balance. So seeing the students do their thing and doing their things together would be a lot of fun, I think. I'd also love to see more of uh, Nanami because he was very prominently featured in the, I guess, the middle of the show and then took more of a quiet role for, for the remainder. Truman Schroeder asks, of the two mentors we see in the show, Gojo and Toto, which would you rather have teach you and why? Ooh. Gojo and I, I think, wouldn't be a good match because we have similar flaws. I don't think we'd get anything done. <laughs> I think we just goof off. <laughs> I think I'm most interested in Gojo's power, but in terms of a personality match, it would have to be Toto. Yeah, it's definitely Toto. Here's why. I think the times of my life of biggest growth when it comes to that kind of relationship with people were times where I had huge blind spots and those blind spots were areas of greatest necessity to repair, perhaps because they were dragging me down in, in key areas that were dragging down the hole. And I met people who from a place of love, that's key, you know, the, the motivation is key. Blasted me with painful honesty. The brutal truth in a way that felt right. You know, because I think anyone who has a, a deep problem, a deep emotional problem or challenge has the desire to self preserve, but at the same time knows and is relieved by truth when they hear it. You know, it's it's weird, you know, if you have an insecurity, sometimes it's a huge relief for somebody to mention your insecurity as long as as long as it's from a place of love and no judgment, if that makes sense. It's like everyone else is, has been tiptoeing around it and avoiding it. And that gives you no feedback and that lack of feedback makes you feel nervous in a strange way. It's sort of like how praise for no reason is detrimental. You want to have like a clear link to things. You want to understand the world as it exists in reality. So if you do bad things, you are relieved to feel repercussions because it restores a sense of order and balance for the world that you want to believe in, that you might need to believe in. Whereas if you do terrible things to get praise for it, you don't know where you are in the world. You don't know what reality is. You don't know what to aim at or who to, who to aspire to be because everything's fine. There are no guidelines. The best situation is when you feel you've done something wrong, you feel like you have a problem, but you're not really equipped or ready to do it by yourself, but then suddenly comes along and hits you with something that you cannot ignore. You were primed to to accept it already because of the, you know, you have a question and someone gives you the answer and that answer is painful, but you can't unsee it. That I think is sort of Toto's defining thing. You know, I was thinking about how the girl thing is kind of funny. You know, the question of what is your type is used for humor, but the, the core tenant in it is not girls, but honesty. It's not hiding from the truth. That's what makes him and Yuji such a great pair. You know, Yuji is actively struggling and seeking a way to get better because it's meaningful to him to get better. It's painful for him to not be equipped. It's painful for him to see people die. And Gojo gives him a great gift in his training, but also doesn't complete it in a key way. Because he's like, you'll get there, you know? But Toto immediately demands a higher standard for him. And Yuji being open and willing to learn and being motivated is just so ready for it. And I kind of live for that. You know, I would say one of the most influential people in my life is, you know, one of my best friends, but in a way like an older brother and mentor, he's someone I go to often because he is never going to sugarcoat anything. Well, first of all, he's insightful. I mean, that's key. It's not just about blasting people. It's about, you know, having some insight and then blasting people and not doing it in a way that tries to take them down, but doing it in a place that expects greatness, you know, expects better things, giving a higher thing to aim at, giving a noble target to aspire to. This person has said all sorts of things to me that I think most people are afraid to think about or afraid to see, but then also probably wouldn't say to my face because they're more concerned with, you know, the, the feeling of it, which has its role and is valuable. But I think that's more common. And so the kind of direct approach where look at the raw truth, assuming it's true, is such a relief. You know, it's such a rare gem. To give a recent example, you know, I'm sort of like in a weird in-between place with my, my girlfriend in terms of the status of our relationship. And along the way, there have been times where we fought or had difficulties. And, you know, I'll, I'll call people and talk about it and vent and stuff. And this is not a criticism at all. This is immensely valuable to me and I need this too. But most people immediately take my side, are empathetic, find ways to understand me, and are just really warm. And I just feel like they're in my corner. And I, I need that. But it's great to have both because then I call my, my friend, this guy, and actually he almost exclusively takes her side. And it's not because he's on her side. He's on my side, for sure. But his approach is always aiming higher. So if there's a problem in any way, not to say she's perfect, but if it's between the two of us, there's probably something about me and my assumptions, the way I handle things, maybe hangups I have, that at least contributed to the situation. And if the goal is growth, the focus is not at all about what she did wrong or who's to blame. It's about how can I look more honestly at reality and grow as a result of it? Because that's what's in my power to do. So I always go to him. I go to other people too, but I always make sure to go to him for that because I want to get that. I want to take as much advantage as possible of the things that are directly in my power rather than kind of seeding that 
that off, you know, or spinning stories where it's not my fault, etc. Whatever the status of the relationship, I have learned so much from that process. You know, I have created such a, a clearer vision of who I want to be and blind spots I had about things I was doing wrong and selfishness that I had that I didn't understand. And it's not about blame. It's not about saying that I'm a terrible person or whatever. That's not the point. The point is about insight. Watching Toto, I am reminded of that friend. It's that same approach, I think. And in that, with my friend and with Toto, there's love in there. Like, Toto is crying when Yuji does well because actually he wants the best for him. It's not about tearing him down. It's not about hurting him or destroying him. It's not an ego trip. It's not about being looked up to or having someone subservient to him. It's about a commitment to something better and nothing will get in the way of that. And it's such a beautiful thing. Dreams of Caffeine asks, what are you hoping to see in the second season? As I mentioned in the first question, my, my favorite, most intriguing part of the show is the characters and their philosophy. So I'd love to see the show take a little bit more time to breathe with that, as much of that as possible. You know, take any of these characters, because we set up so many good ones, put them in a room, or put them in a situation that, that is demanding, or challenging, and let them hash it out. Also, I don't know if this will be in the second season or in the future, but as I've mentioned, I have a very, very strong feeling that Gojo is not going to be around forever. He's going to be compromised. And there's something about that idea that's so exciting, because, you know, you always sort of feel safe knowing he's around. It almost seems too good narratively to pass up, you know what I mean? There's also what feels like the inevitability of... Yuji eating all the, the fingers. Like, all the buttons that they can push, I want to see push, if that makes sense. I want to see Toto ask Takata out. <laughs> want to see more Panda, obviously. I want to see what happens with the Jujutsu Sorcerers, that whole organization, because as I've mentioned in videos, I feel like it's sort of prime, prime for the falling. It's a very weird and split organization, it seems. One thing you commonly find in these hero stories is that it's not just about winning. It's not like there's a game that's set up from the beginning and the protagonist just does the best at the game. It's more like the protagonist initially is fighting the game, but then has a higher insight that is outside of the game and then conquers both the game and that higher thing that is outside of the game. Moving things one iteration forward in what I think is kind of a metaphor for life where things are always kind of swinging between extremes, but if things are going well, they're not swinging back to the same place. Some kind of innovation happens, whether it's technological or ideological, that makes the old game kind of obsolete. And it's something like permanent progress. You know, you don't have to retread those steps anymore. Some major victory in that way. The villains, I think I can more easily wrap my head around at this point. They are human misery. And, you know, we don't need to look very hard to understand human misery. And I think the Jujutsu society has some great elements and is doing a noble thing, but has some non-noble elements. There's a lot of outdated tradition, it seems. There is discrimination, as brought up by some of the episodes. There's this ideological thing that's come up a lot on this channel, especially with Attack on Titan, about ends justifying means. There are higher targets, and I think that Yuji is probably the one, along with his crew, to reach some of those targets, which will mean pain. It'll mean getting out of the, the safety net, currently represented by the Jujutsu Society and, and Gojo. Samuel Fanley asks, can you please review the milk ramen recipe? R milk ramen? Milk ramen recipe. I'm really split on this because on the one hand, I've been a broke college student, and so I respect the innovation. This cannot be unique to me. I'm sure a lot of people have had this experience where you're subsisting on really cheap food like ramen, and you just get so sick of it, you're forced to innovate. Every condiment, every canned food, whatever is around is fair game, goes into the ramen. Not all recipes are created equal, but once you start down the path of innovating cup ramen, you never go back. In fact, there was one time in college when I was living in a dorm, for whatever reason, I thought it would be a good idea to fry the ramen. And I'm going to say what's going to become really obvious. I had no cooking knowledge at all, but I didn't even bother to cook the ramen. I just put the dry ramen in the frying pan with some oil. And then I got distracted. One of my doormates was watching Sex in the City and it just sucked me right in. And the next thing I knew the fire alarms were going off. It was like 2 a.m. in February, I want to say. And so the whole dorm was forced to evacuate in the middle of the night because I was the genius frying dried ramen. I never lived that down. Anyway, I say that to say I admire the innovation of the milk ramen. That being said, I feel like milk is sort of a weird thing to add. Milk is kind of dicey. Like, you can go really wrong with it. The wrong ingredients in there and it, it just, it sours. But if that's not happening, I can imagine it being being delicious because you know, there's some really great creamy ramen out there. I think you'd have to exercise a little bit of imagination there. For some reason, there, there's like a, a, a mental weirdness having milk in my cup ramen. Aura Y asks, which character did you relate to the most? Which characters would you like to see more from next season? At the risk of sounding egotistical, there are two characters that I, I relate to somewhat. One is Nanami. I think that I have the same thing he has that he 
feels the need to respond to things that require no response in a, you know, sort of a break it down and analyze it and respond fashion where it's not necessary. Like he just has sort of a compulsion to set things straight if he feels they're wrong. That's something that I've had to kind of rein in. I mean, I think it's a, it's a really good skill to have when it's required, but another complementary skill that you need is you need to know when it's required. <laughs> That's sort of the key thing. Sometimes what people are saying is not about the content of what they're saying, but the emotion behind what they're saying or looking for some kind of solidarity or just not even taking it that seriously. You know, they're just kind of speaking whimsically or testing things out. And, you know, there's always that guy who is like, well, actually, you know, and that person is sometimes me. And there's also the common detail that he has a background in finance which I also have. And then the other is Gojo, and it's not his expertise, it's not his mastery, it's not even his coolness. It's a little bit of the, the chaos, the refusal to be hemmed in, having a streak for mischief and wanting to see people's reactions, being a little bit of a troll, and it put in somewhat of a negative light, an occasional disregard for the impact of his actions, and not respecting protocol in ways that are that are both good and bad, I'd say. And in your own words, how would you describe Yuji's character arc? So I get a feeling from, from this comment and other comments that there's kind of a, a mixed reaction to Yuji and his, his philosophy, his outlook, his motivation. And I kind of get why that is. And I, I think to give the show and Yuji's character maximum credit, I think part of that is deliberate. I think he's in a process of discovery. But some of the pieces of it that come to mind that I, you know, might form a picture if looked at together are the fact that, well, he's obsessed with giving people a good death. There's something about that that seems inexorably linked to having a good life, as well as honoring people's humanity. Connected to that is the idea that he is basically primed to die, right? And there's something about that extra attention to death that brings a heightened focus to life. This, I think, is maybe best captured not by anything in the show directly, but in the second opening, where he's kind of looking at great moments of him and the crew and trying to capture it. The pain of knowing he's marching towards his end is forcing him to look a little bit more clearly at the things that are happening and, and what life means. Where, as I said at the beginning of the show, he seems unawake. He's just this random kid with amazing athletic prowess almost like an empty vessel with his grandfather's death he seems to find some meaning in people's lives which leads him to risk his life to sacrifice as well as to consume a great evil in a sort of pandora's box like thing where he's now opened his own mortality exposing himself to curses which is the pain of life pain of humanity and then trying to make sense of that and what it all means. So I don't know where exactly it's going, but there's something about Yuji that is going to be a key answer to either or both the meaning of life, the meaning of existence, human existence, or what it means to truly live. I'm curious to see where Yuji goes because he seems to be a work in progress. I mean, he, you see him shifting his ideals throughout the show. He talks about never killing, and then that sort of goes out the window at a certain point. So he's revising. I do know he's going to be the one who sort of solves a key problem. That's obvious in him being in the protagonist slot, but the show has a lot of moments that let you know that. One of which is the, the baseball episode where he's the only one who knocks it out of the park and everyone kind of stands back in awe. There's something special about Yuji that is crucial to this world. It's crucial to solving a problem and creating the next iteration in this long long struggle between curse and curse fighters. And one guess as to what that could be in connection to the whole death thing is a heightened focus on the truth, a certain value for human life, especially in contrast with the rest of the sorcerers that seem to see life as disposable or expendable towards their goals. An overall honesty in nature, a kind of purity, even if that might feel a little cliche, and a camaraderie with others that is connected to a sense of respect and honoring of of other people in their lives. What was your overall experience with Yuji so far? He definitely grew on me. And I think one key thing was realizing that he's growing. I think in some ways his process, the way he undergoes things, is has been one of the most relatable in terms of watching show protagonists because I think I've always been sort of an idealist but with each new thing I learn, my previous vision of the world seems so simplistic even when I you know, at times was convinced that was the whole thing, you know, I had to figure it out. It just gets deeper and deeper the farther I go. And that ends up being a really fun process if you have the kind of freedom that Yuji has. And I think one of his best characteristics is his openness. He's looking, you know, he's seeking, and he always has a working model, which is great. I think it's it's kind of unsatisfying to me when I hear things like, well, there's just no meaning. Life has no meaning. There's no such thing as truth. I can sympathize with that idea because of how difficult it is and the unlikelihood that anyone will ever fully grasp something as large as truth. But what's more satisfying to me is 
not a set of tenants, but maybe a process. You know, like what is the best theory that you have? You know, what is the best model that you have for what life means and you know who you are? And then not being super attached to that, going out and trying to apply that and seeing how it works and how you feel about it. And then being open to adjustments, being open to more nuance, being open to being wrong. And I think Yuji exemplifies that process really well. Some of his purity is being like a kid. You know, he's experiencing the world for the first time. He had a lot on his plate added very quickly and he has shown capable in taking it in stride adapting and surpassing expectations and i think that that is a testament not necessarily to his physical ability although there's that too or to any kind of innate ability in fact i think he's often um, being depicted as not having innate ability in certain ways but rather his openness there's a humility to him that's really cool he learns well for that reason you know, he takes mentorship really well he's not heavily attached to his ideas which is partly why he can take that abuse you know i think for most people someone like toto comes along and toto's a threat you know toto's someone you hate but yuji gets kicked around by him and his response is something like, thank you, best friend, oh, can I have some more, you know? Big Head asks, if you could create your own curse for the jujitsu world, what would it be? Ooh, that's tough. Because Jujutsu Kaisen is good at kind of matching curses or abilities with personalities, I'm trying to think of things that would suit me. The first one that comes to mind is something like sacrificing attack and defensive power in the beginning of the fight for having way more as the fight progresses. Just because I feel like there are a lot of ways I feel I had a late start or was not prepared or underdeveloped that makes my base stats in certain areas pretty low but I kind of pride myself in throwing myself into things and sorting it out and rising to a level that I'm satisfied with that i'm capable or sufficient i've overcome some really huge hurdles in that way or maybe something like the more hits i take in the beginning the stronger i get later because i feel like that's actually a model for a lot of the things i'm most proud of it's like just taking abuse but having the fortitude to keep going with it until i i get what i need out of it a random one i get stronger every time a villain uses a cliche like i'm having so much fun or licks their lips and major stat boosts if they say something about humanity being terrible or life having no meaning. I would single-handedly eliminate villain cliches with my presence. And what kind of curse technique would you like to have? Well, it seems like being able to heal is a really valuable skill that not, a, not enough people have. I think that would that would suit me. But it's hard to think of anything cooler than Gojo. I know that's kind of a cop-out answer. Who would turn down the infinite, you know? Visually though, and also in terms of uh, variability, I'd say a runner-up would be Nobara. Her, her quirk is awesome. I say quirk. <laughs> Pi asks, whose domain expansions do you think we'll see in season two? Speaking of Nobara, I think she's a good candidate. We saw that she was able to use Black Flash at the end. She's growing really quickly, though it might not happen soon. Toto's domain will just be a big ass. Panda's domain will be a cage with zebras you can punch. Miwa's domain, or maybe this would be Mai's domain, is a refrigerator. I guess the domain I'm most curious about is Yuji. You, what will Yuji's domain be? And he's a good contender for next on the list, just judging by how fast he's developing and growing in terms of his skill set. This is just a huge guess. I have nothing to base it on, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's similar to Mahito's domain and that it's very morbid, death-like, since death is such a focal point for his character. Oak asks, what are your thoughts on the power system and how in many cases we can see aspects of characters' personalities through their powers, like Gojo? So <laughs> the power system gave me a lot of trouble in the show. I think it's the most complex system out of all the shows I've watched on this channel. So I'm always a little bit behind on it, but I think there are a lot of really cool aspects of it. I like the fact that they write in exposition as a necessary thing for battling. That was a really cool touch. I do really like that the characters' personalities have a link with their powers. I like the range and creativity and visualization of it. I especially love the domains. That Every time someone uses a domain, it's a visual treat. Gojo's powers look amazing and awesome and are connected to some really cool concepts that I, I really hope they go into more detail on, speaking of which. There's a lot of potential. I think once I nail it down, if I'll ever nail it down, there's so many really cool applications that I think will be more than just the powers, but will have insight in the powers as to the characters and their philosophies, which, as I said, is one of the most exciting aspects of the show for me this far. Benji asks, which show has better fight scenes slash action, Demon Slayer or Jujutsu Kaisen. It's tough because I feel like I'm suffering from recency bias because I just finished Jujutsu Kaisen. Demon Slayer feels like a while ago, even though it was right before, just because so much has happened in my life. It's difficult to compare, but I will say that I think the Toto Yuji team up against, uh, crap, Tree Spirit in those two episodes is the highlight of both of those shows put together, I think. At least in terms of the fighting itself and the animation and the use of powers 
it's hard for me to top that, but I think I would give it to Demon Slayer in terms of emotional weight and stakes to fights. One of the most intriguing things about Jujutsu Kaisen also I think is an area of weakness at times, which is that it moves at breakneck speed. So it's like one huge arc to the next, and at times I felt like I hadn't quite caught up to the action yet. Like my emotions weren't as developed as they, they could have been in the actual fights. Whereas in Demon Slayer you have things like the kids coming off the Rengoku incident, being motivated towards a new purpose, and then that whole entertainment district arc, which is phenomenal, and they're coming together as a team, the stakes have been established, they have things to prove, you know, it's it was given a little bit more time to breathe. You know, I think season two of Demon Slayer, two concrete arcs that are connected, whereas I think Jujutsu Kaisen's one season has like what, four arcs, five arcs? Just so much happens so quickly. I think Demon Slayer's fights tend to have a little more weight, especially talking about season two. Though I think comparing season one Demon Slayer to season one Jujutsu Kaisen, Jujutsu Kaisen might win out in that regard, or at least it'll be very close. Not to harp on this too much, but man, I think it's episode 20 of Jujutsu Kaisen. It's just so special. Like the Toto Yuji team up, Yuji being badass, Toto having his chance to shine, showing up his what is it, 9,000 IQ, that great fake out with the switch. And one thing that makes that scene so great is that it's great and then it continues to be great and then it continues to be great. Like they take a great fight and they just stretched it through the whole episode and it didn't lose quality at any point. And then if that wasn't good enough, then Gojo shows up. And it's like, that could have been good enough action for just about any other show itself, but it comes on the heels of this great team up. So pretty much peak as far as I'm concerned. Default Goblin asks, what do you think the show did better or worse than Demon Slayer? This is connected to the previous question, so I think that one thing Jujutsu didn't do as often, at least, as Demon Slayer is hit those really poignant emotional moments. In terms of what Jujutsu does better, there's a bunch of things I would say. I think it's more consistent in terms of overall tone. There are a lot of moments of Demon Slayer that feel a little bit too whimsical, whereas I think Jujutsu Kaisen has levity, but I think the levity is done really well in a way that fits with the whole a little bit better. Oh, speaking of which, I think Jujutsu strolls are hands down better than Taisho Secrets, being not just talking heads, but like actual events and skits, and as far as I know, being mostly canon. I would also say that while I think Demon Slayer has more sort of emotionally impactful moments, I would say that Jujutsu Kaisen has more moments of insight, intriguing ideas and depth as delivered by characters like Gojo and Toto and Nanami. Characters feel a little bit less tropey. Demon Slayer, although this is fleshed out and extended, I think, and somewhat saved by season two. Initially, I think it relies a little bit more on character tropes and roles than Jujutsu Kaisen does. I also think that Jujutsu Kaisen has more interesting villains, more in the style of My Hero Academia, and has a sort of parallel plotline. Although I really, really hate Gogo. I can't stand him. I wish he was not a character. It's tough. I mean, they're both great. Here's something that I think is night and day above Demon Slayer, and that's writing female characters. Not that Demon Slayer set a super high bar. Having a main female lead who is literally gagged. Not Just Engineering asks, what are your thoughts on Maki and Mai's relationship, or Maki's character as a whole? I feel a little bit bad about this. I kind of mixed up stuff. For some reason, I was under the impression that Maki was powerless, and that's why she was the disgrace. And then it turns out in that episode that no, actually, she's the powerful one, and Mai is sort of the, the black sheep, despite having more curse power. Whatever the case may be, I think my favorite element of their relationship, or I should say that scene, is Mai's question, why didn't you just let me fall, or why didn't you let me go into the hole? Why didn't you let me stay stuck, or whatever it was? You know, why didn't you just leave me in safety, even if I know that safety to be full of compromises? And it sort of raises the question, was Maki being selfish? And it seems like, yeah, part of it was selfish. Part of it is her motivated by emotion and motivated by a desire to get revenge, to prove herself, to change things, and dragging Maya along in the process, but it doesn't seem like it's total disregard. To me, there's an element of tough love in it, and I think that's part of what makes the relationship compelling, is that it's conflict, but the conflict almost couldn't be there if, if there wasn't some really deep regard for each other. Maybe that's more evident on my side, because Mai is the one most deeply conflicted, and Mai is the one having this breakdown, and Maki sort of just doing her thing. But it didn't feel to me like Maki was uncaring. One thing I will say about Maki's character that impressed me, you know, from early impressions to that episode, the way I first saw it was that Maki is trying to get revenge or prove herself to her, you know, her family, but I think it's more than that. I think it's not just a chip on her shoulder, but it's also a desire to change. Like, her goal is to become the head, and is that only about proving herself? I don't think so, because that's that's a big task to take on. That seems like responsibility. There's something more noble about that than I first expected. Maddie Grandstaff asks, are you planning on watching the movie? Yes, as soon as I can get my hands on a authorized, legitimate digital copy. But it will be Patreon only because at this point I have completely given up on doing movies on YouTube. It's just way too difficult. Jake asks, what were you impressed by that this series did differently or executed uniquely compared to other series? First thing that comes to mind is scope. Like, they really put a lot into season one. And like I said, that's 
sort of a double-edged sword because I respect how quickly the plot moves and how much they give you and how things never stagnate, but there is also a case to be made that if they had let things sort of marinate a little bit, some of the stuff would have hit harder. So I'm kind of, I kind of have mixed feelings about that. Also coming to mind is the, the tone is a little bit different or the setting maybe. It feels a little bit more lifelike, a little bit more realistic. The environments, the streets, the cars, the city itself. There's something about the designs of that and also the characters that makes it feel older in appearance, if that makes sense. I also think the concept of domains is really amazing. It's such a neat little thing to add. They have their powers and their abilities, but then they have this extra thing that's just super cool. It's like their own little universe that conveys their personalities to an extent. Such a great touch. I also think the characters stand out in a very interesting way. They're some of the most unique cast of characters in a bunch of ways, like in design, like Panda and Mechamaru, very intriguing, very interesting. The female characters feel really different. I like how the show even makes fun of it by saying they're they're not nice. <laughs> they're definitely not trope female characters, right? And also among that extended cast, there are some really, really bright spots that I think own kind of top spots in my in my mind about side characters. So for example, Gojo is just amazing. And then Toto being this, um, this huge shock, but just being great in so many ways. And then in terms of things that I think it, it doesn't quite get to the, the heights other shows do. As I've mentioned, I think emotional stakes for fights. To elaborate on this and give an example, I think one of the things that's meant to be the most hard hitting is the death of, say I already forgot his name, Yuji's friend with the mom. We know him for like five seconds and it's still sad, but that was it. It took me a while to register the fact that he was gone. You know, there was no, like, emotional catharsis that happened. And that's probably on me, but... Martin Van Buren III asks, on the topic of Yuji, do you think it's healthy to remind ourselves often of our inevitable demise? To paraphrase a little bit, how do you find balance? How do you act despite anxiety? Does it take reflection on death to find motivation? There's just so much in this question, but I'll do my best. First of all, the whole idea that, you know, you should live each day like it's your last. Like most sayings, there's something great in there but it's not going to encapsulate the whole so you know actually i think some of the greatest joys in my life have been from delayed gratification it's been from reining in my impulses you know and my immediate desires and the ability to be free you know i can do that really well i'm really good at that and it's brought me a lot of utility but there's a lot to be said for balance. You want to have the moments of impulse and the, the great pleasures and the joys of being alive and taking in the moment. But you also want to prove things to yourself. You know, you want to do things that meet your expectations of yourself and make you feel satisfied and, and alive. And some of those things, you know, some of the really big things, most of the really big things probably, at least in a certain department, are going to take overriding yourself and thinking really big picture and really long term in a way that's unnatural. You know, I think one of the main facets of intelligence or human intelligence specifically is the ability to abstract beyond one's instincts. You know, so like things that I have to overcome are feeling rushed, you know, feeling like I have to do everything right now or that any success I could possibly have would have to happen tomorrow and rather understand that at an abstracted level that, well, now at this age, I'm even better off and happier in many ways and more solid in many ways and enjoying life more fully in many ways than I was 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, I couldn't imagine even existing at this age. I wanted to skip all these steps and just, you know, be going wherever I was going right then and looking for only the perfect thing. And if I didn't have something perfect in hand that was, you know, Im immediately avail available to me and expertly crafted, then I just shouldn't act, which was a huge mistake. You know, if I had just taken things more step by step and had faith in the longer picture and seen it as a process and focused more on daily incremental improvement, I would be way ahead of where I am now in, in some ways. Not that I have any regrets and would perhaps be more fulfilled yet at the same time you want to be present for what you're doing you don't want to put all of your utility all of your life and your experiences into some distant moment when good momentary things come your way to try to experience them as best you can and you know maybe practice something like gratitude or just heightened observation of it to look at it in the other direction from what I was just saying in hindsight there were a lot of times where I had things that were really great that I, I would never have again but didn't know it at that time and then later longed for those aspects of my life so I think there's a best of both worlds situation and I think if memento mori or the act of reflecting on death is useful towards the aim of being grateful or appreciating what you have or making you take action, then I think that that's great and, you know, use whatever you have. So if the idea of being impermanent and having a limited lifespan makes you more likely to take the actions you want to take but are afraid to, then just push that as far as I can go, I say. But I don't think it necessarily has to be a reflection on death. I actually think what's a better motivation for me is not thinking about the impermanence of my life, but just having more pronounced or articulated concepts of what I 
like and don't like and who I want to be and who I don't want to be. I've heard that one way to be courageous is not to have no fear, but to be afraid of the right things. And I think one thing I really don't like, you know, one experience I, I loathe is feeling like I failed myself, feeling like I've gotten farther away from who I want to be or just haven't moved at all. Tied into this idea for me is the concept that nothing is coming to help. Like there will be no event that makes it happen. Luck exists, timing exists, but that's not an actionable plan. And chances are for most people, nothing is gonna come free. It has to be something that you you do. And I don't even think that it's a mind state you have to get into. I think it's more like just action. You know, I think we talk a lot about mind state to create action, but in, in my experience, or what's been more useful for me is to think that action creates mindset. So like you mentioned shooting your shot when it comes to dating, which admittedly is like the most terrifying thing. And you know, everyone has varying odds of success in whatever, but let's just take a random number. Let's say you, uh, you shoot 20 shots and you make one. While this might not be the case in terms of basketball and field goal percentage, it is the case in things like dating where I think one success erases all the failures. Like you have one great partner, great relationship that feels right and is what you want. All of the other failures become funny. It's only at the point where you feel unfulfilled and existentially threatened that those things feel bad. If you turn a corner and kind of get what you need and prove yourself to yourself, you can connect all of those failures to something that is great. And so all those failures in their way become great, even if, you know, there's still a tinge of embarrassment in there somewhere. <laughs> like, admittedly, I have a lot of embarrassment about my misses, but, you know, I can laugh about it. And I am grateful for the experience because I got what I needed out of that experience. Conversely, if you treat each interaction like it's the only interaction, like it's your last chance, then you're going to find it hard to act. You're going to be more crushed by defeat, less likely to try again. You know, you just let yourself off the hook and allow yourself to not be great at things that you haven't really done a lot and realize that embarrassment is nothing to be afraid of. Then it becomes a matter of not gearing yourself up to be in the right mindset, but practice. Just getting enough push to get yourself over that hump one time, that can be the game changer. You know, just showing yourself that you can do it. I would also differentiate emotional risk from physical risk. Like, I think I had this trap when I was younger, thinking that if I was scared to do something, I had to do it. I've updated that slightly to one, having it need to be connected to something that will benefit me, that is of kind of spiritual importance or personal growth importance, rather than it just being dangerous and me trying to overcome fear. And two, doing my best to avoid things that would just be game ending, right? That would destroy me. And I would add three, doing things that feel wrong. I'll give you sort of an embarrassing example, but I feel like it illustrates the point in kind of a microcosm. When I was actively going out and I was interested in dating as like an activity, I developed a policy that, that changed my life. And that policy was a commitment to when I went out, every time I went out, I would talk to a minimum of 10 people that I was attracted to. And I don't mean like, hi, bye. I mean, like it had to be a meaningful conversation for me to check it off the list. And it was a pretty amazing experience. I mean, for one, one thing it helps with is you're immediately accepting failure, which is key. You know, you just accept that the first ones are going to suck, but you're keeping your eye on the, on the grand picture, which is 10 because you just trust that, you know, the odds are in your favor. And the first one's always the hardest and it hurts. It sucks like hell, but you survive it. And then you go on to the second one and the first one's already gone out of your mind. And so immediately you've cleared the air. You've sort of freed yourself because, well, you already took a hit and that was the worst hit you were going to take and you got over it and you're still in the game. You're still having fun. Plus you're practicing now. I would consider myself an extrovert, but I'm not really natural with people. Like I'm naturally somewhat reserved when it comes to meeting new people. But you have this kind of rapid fire interaction or you're meeting, you know, five, six, seven people a night. You get to the maximum of where you 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 can go. You hit your sort of limit because you're just practicing it. You get in the zone, you get warmed up or whatever. And I never even made it to 10. I never had to because by, you know, the mid mid level, usually by like five, six, things are clicking and I'm hitting it off with people and it's going great and I'm having a blast. And it seems like the other person's having fun too. But yeah, always the hardest thing is going to be the first step. And there's a variety of ways to get motivation out of that. But I think the way for me is not thinking about the impermanence of my life as much as just having a very clear standard and feeling a very strong sense of disappointment where something actually has no discernible risk, but I don't do it, even though I really want to do it and I feel like it's right to do it. I don't like that feeling and that feeling is enough of a motivator. I'm a big believer in you are what you practice, you know, so I, I don't even think a big event, you know, like a, a terminal illness would necessarily guarantee any kind of results. It has to be backed by you know, will and resolve. And maybe that could be the trigger, but it might not be. It all depends on how you do with it. And the things that you would do with terminal illness to 
get you motivated are things you could just you could do now you just have to develop sufficient emotion sufficient drive to do it and i think that will come from maybe nurturing a healthy fear of the alternative you know what what would you be if you never did the things you want to do you know that sucks jeremy ocasio asks we know curse energy is stronger the more negative emotion a person puts into it what do you think is in gojo's backstory that could cause him so much negative emotion man that's a tough one in a show filled with tragedy it's hard for me to think of one specific event or life event i mean i would say war but that feels unlikely to me just given the fact that it's set in in modern day but that would just be if i was trying to rank events in terms of pain which i always think is a mistake you know pain is sort of a relative thing he could have a great life he could have the perfect life on paper and still understand negative emotion deeper than other people that's just kind of how it works he might just be inclined to thought and human emotion. It's not like people who have it objectively better are happier. You know, it seems like in a lot of cases they're they're more miserable. And you hear about people in just the worst of, of circumstances finding meaning in their struggles. So it's just tough to say. I would wager a guess and say that there's a depth to his intellect that doesn't come through or is somewhat masked by his goofiness. I actually think his goofiness is a sign of intelligence. And we've seen in a couple of moments his intense seriousness and sort of higher concept thinking. I wouldn't be surprised if this is all just something that he's come to, that it's, it's, it's rationalization. Especially considering the fact that he's a rebel, I feel like there's something about having a rebellious spirit that leads you to some very interesting and deep places intellectually. There's a lot of wisdom in the status quo. I mean, the status quo is probably mostly wisdom, but if you take a person who just along all criteria is exactly the average person in terms of status quo outlook, that can be very intelligent, but it's not necessarily insight. You know what I mean? I mean, I think even to understand the status quo at a deep level, you have to first abandon the status quo. Having a set of beliefs does not guarantee understanding of those beliefs. I mean, just about everyone has an opinion on just about everything if you ask them, but how many people have actual deep knowledge? So you can have two people who have the same beliefs and have hugely varying levels of understanding of those things. And then there's something even outside of that, which is taking that, taking the base, finding connections and sort of getting out of the pre-established nodes a little bit, forging new nodes, making new connections. That's where some of the, the real genius lies. That requires something like, let's not call it rebellion, but let's call it risk taking to some degree. Because if you're allowing yourself to think outside the box, you're also in a way allowing yourself to be vulnerable because we all kind of rely on a structure to feel safe. We, we need a mental structure to feel like we understand our world. To depart from that can be lonely and terrifying. Mm -hmm. And I think Gojo's mm -hmm. personality shows he has the ability to stomach that. In fact, he can thrive in it. He seems to excel in this kind of contrarian space in many ways. <laughs> he might have a chip on his shoulder. That's something I, I think is correlated with this rebellious intellectual streak sometimes, is being dissatisfied with your current environment, not wanting to follow in its footsteps exactly. Everyone wants to aspire to things. Everyone wants to measure up to something great. And one way to find that is not in the system, you know, or establish, establishing yourself in the system, but differentiating yourself from that system. And Gojo seems to be the latter type. And if he has natural aptitude, I could see that leading him to a range of emotions and understanding that is freer, more open, has more depth, has more emotional intuition, contains a great deal of existential pain, etc. On that note, Marina asks, what are your thoughts on Gojo's character in general and his personality and interactions with other characters? It's funny you mentioned lonely because I was just thinking that. One thing I like about Gojo is that the fact that he can do whatever he wants shows you who he is on some level that you don't get with most people. This is a very old concept, but a lot of people who are good are not good because they have truly deeply resonated with the idea of being good and you know the values that come with it but just are not able to do evil for fear of consequence you know they don't act on their base desires so i think about this a lot you see this again and again and again in different forms i was just watching the documentary the most hated man on the internet about the guy who made a revenge porn site and he created this mass army of followers that just seem like really hateful people and you know it's not like he created these people they were just there waiting for an outlet and he gave them one and they were emboldened and so they you know they reared their heads that's always an element of, of society of any human group there's going to be that element and the cause changes shape the medium changes shape but it's a constant in life but gojo can do whatever he wants and so when he does something you're like okay that's who he is and it's not quite clear what he wants yet, I, I don't think. It's not to say that he's good, necessarily. You know, he is planning on killing Yuji. He doesn't seem above hurting other people. But I think at least we can say there's really good stuff in there. And that goodness is heightened by the fact that you know it's actually his goodness. Like, he's taking interest in the kids. He's trying to bring out their best potential. You might make the argument that if we're being 
ultra cynical. Maybe it's just for power. Maybe he's trying to amass followers for whatever. But even then, he doesn't really need them, right? I mean, he could do whatever he wants. He's got the infinite. So why would he spend his time on, on these kids? Why does he not wipe out the hierarchy of sorcerers and take control. Why does he not crush the ants? You know, he can do whatever the hell he wants. I think most people given his situation would do a lot worse. At the same time, I understand why people have a, a bad reaction to him. I think anybody who really likes things to be structured and takes things seriously can be offended by someone who doesn't. And he just doesn't give a crap. I mean, why would he? I think I mentioned in one of those reactions that I feel similar to him in a certain way and I've had problems with him in a certain way especially in a teaching capacity. People who really like things to be structured in a way they can predict don't like my teaching methodology. Funnily enough, some of the students I felt the most conflict with as a teacher were definitely students at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of performance, but also were some of the students at the highest level of performance because those were the kids who crushed it at school and kids who crush it at school generally really want to understand and feel secure in knowing the ins and outs of the curriculum and being able to predict what's coming. Whereas my focus, for better or worse, I'm not saying this is a good thing, was not the tests or the grades or the curriculum, but feeling like I was doing things that got the kids better at something, that they actually came to improve on a skill, which was English in this case, that would make them more functional in whatever things they needed to apply English on, rather than predicting the exam or knowing what to expect from every lesson and having a set routine every lesson and set time frame, whatever. Gojo has his aims, and he's going to go towards those aims, and he's not going to be concerned with filler. And anyone who expects certain things from him is going to be disappointed and perhaps even bitter. Whereas people who are just sort of along for the ride and, and you know put their hands in him in order to develop their, their skills as it applies most directly to being a sorcerer and can kind of let go a little bit are going to love Gojo because he's going to take them for a ride. He's going to show them things they never imagined. I find him really likable. I find him endearing. I find him really funny and really cool. I would definitely be team Gojo as a student. I chose Toto in the previous question as my mentor but that would be for, for growth because I value the honesty. But I think in terms of personality compatibility and fun, it would it would be Gojo. Lillian B asks, what is your opinion on the girls in this show? <laughs> Especially compared to other shonen. Let's not compare it to Demon Slayer again. Again, I thought it was hilarious that they deliberately pointed out in a Jujutsu Sampo that none of them were nice except for Miwa. I do really like Nobara. I think one of my low-key favorite moments in the show is her speech against uh, Harry Potter about... <laughs> being confident, accepting who she is. I don't really have anything specific to say other than it's refreshing. It's different. You know, they're not the the tropes that you usually see, for sure. I mean, even Miwa, who's like the the closest, I guess, doesn't feel tropey. She just seems like a nice girl who unfortunately gets her lunch stolen too much. Reed herself asks, what are your feelings on musicals? There's a theatrical stage play for Jujutsu Kaisen. Huh. Yeah, I would definitely watch it. Generally, I'm not a huge fan of musicals, although there are exceptions. I just prefer things to be spoken rather than sung. I think that when done really well, musicals have the potential to be truly transcendent, you know, in combining characterization and meaning with music, which is just designed to be resonant. But I think that that's hard to do. And what you get more often is meaning being sort of diluted by the music. Like in order to fit a structure of a song, you take a concept and just make it kind of stretched out in longer length when maybe a line or two or, you know, some shorter dialogue would have hit home in a way that didn't break the fourth wall as much as like breaking out into song. So in a nutshell, I'm definitely open to watching it, but I'm a little bit skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is the end of the Jujutsu Kaisen q and I can't believe we're at the end of another series. They're just starting to fly by now. Although it's funny that this one, despite being only one season, was a year in the making. I will say that I, I think I am way more excited for season two than I was for season one. Well, that might be obvious. I have a feeling season two is going to make season one look like small fry just because season one was so much it, so much set up and it's so much to do in such a short time. I am very excited to see where the show goes. But thank you all for being part of the journey. Thank you to all patrons for both keeping the channel alive and also emotional support as of late. You guys mean the world to me. Thank you to everybody for watching and hope to see you for the next series, which has yet not been decided by poll. <laughs>